Early in the 20th century, the pace of history seemed to speed up. In the four and a quarter years from August of 1914 to November of 1918, 20 million people, more than one in every hundred of the world's population, died. Three powerful empires collapsed into ashes. The world would never be the same again. The conventional story is that World War I started almost by accident, when a political incident in the Balkans got out of hand and sucked in one European power after another. On the surface, that was what happened. But underneath that iceberg tip lay 90% of the causes, and they weren't political, they were very material and very pressing, and they were unlike anything the world had ever had to deal with before. Industrialization and its resource demands were the problem. In the 1870s, advances in steelmaking pushed industrialization to a new intensity. Steel rails replaced wagon roads, steel turbines spun coal into power, copper wires carried that power from place to place. Nights became light, factories worked around the clock, churning out more goods faster for trains and steamships to carry around the world. Across Europe, a gap quickly rose up between prosperous, industrialized economies based on manufacturing and commerce versus poor, traditional economies based on agriculture. But industrial economies needed raw materials to feed them. Chiefly, this meant fuels and metals, coal, or increasingly oil, to run the engines, steel to make them, copper wires to carry the power soldered into place with lead or tin, zinc to galvanize the steel to resist rust. For armor and gun steels, the iron had to be alloyed with chrome, nickel, manganese, tungsten, or more often, a combination of those ferro-alloy elements. To mine and smelt all of that needed still more coal, and making and running all those machines kept most of the workforce out of the fields, so feeding them required huge mechanized farms that boosted production with fertilizers made from nitrate minerals, the same ingredient that formed the basis for explosives. The quantities needed were gigantic, the more so as militaries industrialized along with economies. Making a single battleship of the early 1900s required anywhere from 8,000 to 12,000 tons of steel, most of it alloyed with hundreds of tons of nickel, chrome, and manganese, galvanized with zinc, and with electrical systems wired by some 200 tons or so of copper. The ship had to stock up with almost 3,000 tons of coal or oil before sailing off, with stops to load more every few thousand miles. Ammunition required tons of nitrate-based explosives packed into brass casings made of copper and zinc every week. Aircraft frames had to be made from aluminum, the only metal both strong and light enough for flying. Those were the minimum resources required. Any country unable to muster them in a modern war would find itself quite literally bringing a knife to a gunfight. The pre-industrial world had never been confronted with this problem. Before about the mid-1800s, technology was low and resource demands were too. But in the industrial era, to find and mine all necessary mineral resources required a huge land mass with rich geological diversity. Unless you were the Tsar of Russia, the only way for a European country to get that was to have colonies. Once just a source of imperial prestige, now they were vital to economy, industry, and military. Britain, for instance, could produce from its own island only iron, tin, and coal, but it could rely on India for manganese and tungsten, Canada for nickel, Rhodesia for chrome, South Africa, West Africa, and Australia for gold, Canada and Australia for lead and zinc, and the Malay states for tin. Only for oil, copper, nitrates, and aluminum was it inconveniently necessary for the British crown to engage in foreign trade. For other European nations, mineral resource supplies were far more precarious. Possessed of smaller or no empires, they had to buy minerals from abroad. 
This was little problem if they were small agrarian economies and didn't need much. But large industrial states found themselves utterly dependent on imported raw materials to keep their economies running. Most dependent and least happy about it was Germany, which had the largest population and the biggest and most industrialized economy on the continent, but which lacked most of the vast colonial possessions that guaranteed Britain and France access to raw materials. Germany could produce plenty of coal and about three quarters of the iron ore it needed, plus some lead, zinc, and copper, but nowhere near enough for demand. All other minerals it needed had to be shipped in. Worse yet, the only way to bring them in was through the English Channel. And the British Navy was always there and always watching. If Britain chose to block Germany's imports, Germany's economy would collapse. This vulnerability might have grated on the egos of men far humbler than Germany's rulers. The proud and paranoid Kaiser Wilhelm II and his ministers found it intolerable. And it was getting worse as German heavy industry almost quadrupled its output from 1885 to 1910 and needed more and more imported minerals. The magnates of Germany's steel, chemicals, and armaments industries, deeply intertwined with the German government, began to join in the chorus, calling for what would today be referred to as supply chain security. Or, as the Kaiser put it, a place in the sun, free from the shadows of British interference. German investors bought up stakes in big overseas mines from America to Australia. They bought up the national debts of resource-producing countries for leverage and began to muscle international metals commerce away from the hitherto dominant British. German capital and technical expertise set forth everywhere from South America to Baghdad to build railroads, factories, and influence. German banks banded together to establish a company to pump Romanian oil and distribute it to friendly nations as a counterweight to Royal Dutch Shell and the rapidly growing British positions in the oil fields of Iraq and Persia. The Kaiser's government began acquiring islands in the Pacific and fortified trading bases in the Philippines, Yemen, and Persia and German agents slipped into British and French colonies abroad, stirring up unrest to loosen the overlord's grip. They edged into French-occupied Morocco and its iron deposits, and into the South African diamond and gold fields that the British had recently taken over. Through the 1890s and early 1900s, the established empires of Britain and France watched with conspicuous alarm and convenient amnesia, Forgetting their own recent history of violent invasion, subjugation, and expropriation of resource-rich foreign countries, they protested Germany's inappropriate international behavior. For the French, the threat was not limited to colonies abroad. In 1870, Germany had taken a large bite out of France itself by conquering the northern provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, and with them most of what were then the second largest known iron deposits in the world. Four decades later, neither France's steel industry nor its national pride had recovered. Determined to prevent Germany from competing with them for global empire, Britain and France began a program of containment. Britain tightened its grip on its existing colonies and started expanding its position in the Middle Eastern oil fields, preempting the rival German interests. France extended loans to Spain, Russia, Austria, Italy, and the Ottoman Empire. British and French diplomats and agents set forth to shore up influence with the governments that mattered. In Chile, which produced more than 99% of the nitrates that made the world's fertilizers and explosives. In the Russian Empire, whose provinces of Ukraine and Georgia were the main exporters of manganese and contained rich iron ores too. In the Ottoman Empire, home to the oil fields of Mesopotamia and most of all in the United States, the world's largest economy and the producer of 65% of all oil, 40% of coal and iron, 55% of copper, and 30% of lead and zinc around the world.
In 1904, the British and French governments officially dropped 900 years' worth of accumulated grudges and signed the Entente Cordiale, committing both to diplomatic and geopolitical partnership. A few years later, they began jointly planning military strategy in case of a war with Germany. Both sides also tried to shore up their positions with overseas alliances. While the Kaiser played footsie with a succession of Ottoman viziers, the British and French courted Russia's empire. Its size, population, and resources of oil, coal, iron, and manganese would make it an unbearable pressure on Germany's east via sheer weight, if nothing else. In 1907, the Russian Empire joined what thus became the Triple Entente. But the constant international maneuvering and counter-maneuvering raised tensions. These ratcheted up further as Germany started building battleships apace, since nobody believed the Kaiser's claim that the fleet was purely for use against Japan. The British government ordered a shipbuilding campaign to match or beat it. Between 1909 and 1914, the resulting naval arms race saw Germany's warship tonnage under construction rise sevenfold and Britain's quintuple, which of course only intensified the competition for mineral resource supplies. By early 1912, the political temperature of Europe had risen so high that everyone feared the next incident would send it boiling over. In a clandestine series of high-level talks, the British and German governments tried to defuse it. The British insisted that Germany shelve its warship building program, while Germany wanted a promise of British neutrality in case of war. What diplomats had expected to be the worst sticking point turned out to be the easiest. Germany's diplomats also demanded an overseas colonial empire with mineral resources suitable to support their country's domestic industrial needs and their Kaiser's spike-helmeted ego. To their surprise, they found the British ready with an offer of colonies owned by the Belgian and Portuguese empires. The former was dependent on Britain for defense and thus could safely be strong-armed, and the latter was in what looked like a death spiral. The British had already preempted it in Africa by grabbing and colonizing most of what are now Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. Arranging for Germany to take over the most of the rest seemed easily doable. That offer was quite close to what Germany's government and industry had dreamed of for years. Mittel Africa was one half of their ideal way to secure their resource base, a wide swath of equatorial to southern Africa that included not only Germany's current colonies there, but Belgium's, Portugal's, and, secretly at this point, several of France's and Britain's. Combined with Mittel Europa, a German-dominated Europe-wide customs union, it would give Germany a place in the sun that was bright indeed. But negotiations foundered anyway on the other two points. The Kaiser wouldn't hear of slowing down construction of his beloved battleships, and the British refused to give a blanket promise of neutrality. The negotiators disbanded, and the escalation continued. Across the major economies of Europe, defense expenditures rose. In 1913, they were 50% higher than they had been a decade earlier, for some countries nearly double, and war planning kicked into high gear. But war planning meant different things. On one side, military planning was exquisite on maneuver, but non-existent as regards resources. The British and French were accustomed to colonial combats of artillery against spears, and had developed military doctrines to match. These had it that fortifications were unglamorous and firepower optional, while the keys to victory were dashing uniforms and fighting spirit. Thus, French war plans outlined in loving detail how cavalry units would sweep across the countryside, but included not a line about shoring up resource supplies or boosting armaments output. Across the Channel, the general who would soon command Britain's army reportedly said that the machine gun has no stopping power against the horse, and to judge from his military methods, he believed it. 
In Russia, the Minister of War bragged that he had not read a military manual in 25 years and opposed his subordinates' suggestions that soldiers should learn to fight with weaponry more modern than the saber. On his watch, the Russian army had grown to 1.4 million men, but possessed only 710 motorized vehicles of any sort. By comparison, German planners thought of warfare, like everything else, in industrial terms. Their plans were equally exquisite about maneuver, but also included the world's first strategic mineral stockpiling program. This began in 1913, and over the next year and a half, imports of nickel and aluminum were up 500%, tin and brass 200%, and manganese was about 50% higher than normal, all while non-mineral imports rose by their usual 7%. Through Danish and Dutch intermediaries, they bought between two and four times as much copper as usual. A Belgian engineer who toured German steelworks early in the summer of 1914 reported that most of them were sitting on several months' worth of ferro-alloy stocks, far more than their usual inventories. They would soon be needed. The string of international incidents between European powers continued, each fraying nerves just a little more. Then, on June 28, 1914, a Bosnian Serb shot dead the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire as he toured Sarajevo. And this time, the result would be something more than an incident.